In this session, we're going to turn our attention as a point of focus. We're not going to forget the parts of thinking, and we'll still be using them in the questioning process. We're going to put special emphasis on standards for thinking, intellectual standards for thinking. Now, the point was made that critical thinking depends on learning what is universal in thinking. The power of the elements of thought as a means of questioning and thinking about thinking is precisely that these parts are universal. If you could only use them once in a while, they wouldn't be nearly as powerful. Well, just as there are universal parts of thinking which you can learn and bring into your thinking as you think about your thinking and improve your thinking because you know these parts, so there are universal standards for thinking. There are universal attributes of thinking which are desirable and universal attributes of thinking that are undesirable. Undesirable not because I said so, but because they defeat the very purpose of thinking itself. They are something intrinsic, if you will, to the logic of thinking and what thinking is trying to do as thinking. For example, thinking is trying to communicate. Thinking is trying to learn. Thinking is trying to explain. And if it is unclear, it doesn't communicate. It doesn't explain. It doesn't learn. So if I say, I've unclearly learned mathematics, that's another way of saying I haven't learned it, or I've ex unclearly explained it to the students, then the, the explanation hasn't succeeded. When the mind is unclear, when it is confused, when it is fuzzy, when it is vague, when it is muddled, then it is not clear. And no one would say with pride, my thinking is fuzzy, vague, muddled, confused, and unclear. So these are attributes of thinking that needs help. They are a failure of thinking to achieve something that thinking is about clarity. If our students learn simply to think clearly, tremendous benefit would come to them. They would say what they mean and mean what they say. Their directions would mislead no one. Their commitments would be real. Uh, much good would come from clear thinking. Politicians could not get elected saying what they're saying today because we would recognize that most of what they're saying is not clear, is not saying anything is just words, not carefully connected with meaning. So clarity of thought is an important attribute of thought. It's universally desirable. Now, there is a second standard of thinking that we're concerned with, and that standard is precision, very closely connected to clarity. Clarity says that what we've said is understandable. Precision brings detail and specificity to that clarity. So if I say, would you like to get something to eat? And you say, yes. Your yes makes clear you would like to get something to eat. But still, you haven't specified yet what you want. So you can say something that is clear. Yes, I would like to get something to eat. But there may be a further specification we need that will make your yes more precise. So precision of thought occurs when we take something which is clear and specified and add detail. So by the way, each of these concerns translates into questions. Let me step back for a moment and deal with clarity at the level of the questions that you can ask to achieve it. And you want students to learn to question their thinking using these standards because the questions that call for clarity help you to achieve clarity. And there are three questions, at least, that you can ask in the act of clarification. There are actually many more than three, but these are three basic ones. We should ask them, and we should teach our students to ask them. Here's the first question. Could you elaborate further on what you have said? Could you express the details in perhaps other words? This is a call for elaboration. Elaboration can clarify. I spell it out more. 
Second question of clarification. Could you illustrate that? Could you give me an illustration? Could you draw a picture, give me a metaphor, give me an analogy? Give me something that il illustrates or models what you're saying. And that's the second point of clarification, a way to achieve greater clarity. Here is the third, and probably of all the most powerful. Could you give me an example of what you mean? Because now the thought is connected with real life. It is translated into something concrete and real that we can all observe and touch and feel and smell. And life is concrete. Life is not abstract. You don't live life abstractly. You live a life, very concrete. You do something specific on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And when I ask my students for examples, they very often say something abstract. I find that my students are poor at giving examples. And I find it interesting that many people say they're concrete thinkers. But I find they're abstract thinkers. They keep talking abstractly. And to give a concrete example is something they know little about. To be specific and detailed and concrete. Give me a for instance. Describe a particular person in a particular situation in a particular context. They're very weak at that. So I don't think students are concrete thinkers. I think they're very abstract thinkers. And they need to become far more concrete than they are. One of the things that, which I loved about uh, Jerry Nosich's talk and Linda Elder's talk is that we're filled with examples. Because it's examples that give power to thinking and that clarify. So three questions. Could you elaborate further? Could you give me an illustration? Could you give me an example? It's clarification. Now let's look at questions regarding precision. It's really a simple, precision is a simple thing, it's adding detail and specificity. So it goes beyond simple clarity to give detail, and, de and detail is sometimes very important. And so the temperature of the patient is hot. The patient is hot. Okay, that's clear enough, and it's a rough thing, but what exactly is the temperature of the patient? Could you give me the details? Now, context determines the degree of precision that is relevant. For example, with something like temperature, we want it to tenths of a degree, 98.4, 100.1. We don't need it to a hundredths of a degree. We don't need it to a thousandths of a degree. And we certainly don't need it to the ten thousandths of a degree. However, if it is a question of lead in the drinking water, we want it in parts per million. So we want much greater specificity for that than this. And so we have to know that precision is a contextual matter and help students to discover this and help them to give the detail and specificity which is relevant to the context. So clarity and precision work hand in hand.